Welcome to Off Screen. This week we're reading The Girl on the Train by Aaron Cressida Wilson. A divorcee becomes entangled in a missing person's investigation that promises to send shockwaves throughout her life. So this is based on a a book that was a huge bestseller both in the UK and in the United States. Which a book which apparently shocked the world, according to the billboards. But not your world. Not I was I was living under a rock, I guess, because I don't know anybody. I never heard about this until the movie came out. I don't know anyone that actually read this book. Yeah, same. Yeah, but um, I guess I don't know a lot of like middle aged housewives or divorcees. So maybe that's oh, why. You think that's the demo? No, honestly, it's probably younger. It's a. Uh... It's very much in the vein of Gone Girl. Yeah. They have, both have like unreliable Although I would say it, it also has shades of gray, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> how how many? <laughs> At least three shades. At least three. Um, yeah, but not quite as uh, bondage-y as that. Right, right. Um, but yeah, Paula Hawkins is the writer of the novel. According to Wikipedia, it was her debut novel. Okay. Um, the film stars Emily Blunt, Haley Bennett, Rebecca Ferguson, Justin Thoreau, Luke Evans, Edgar Ramirez. Okay. But um, anyway, um, do you know about this screenwriter? Yeah. She is a playwright, a screenwriter, and a professor and author. Um, she's maybe... She adapted... She does a lot of adapt- adaptations. Okay. Um, they're all kind of these... Thriller type? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Chloe and this are kind of thrillers. Oh, this kinda... is definitely... I would say this is squarely in the thriller genre. Yeah. Um, and they're kind of like involve suburban people and their okay. internal dramas. Yeah. Just judging off of men, women, children, this and Chloe. Okay. Well, uh, I'll go ahead and do the synopsis, I guess. Yeah. Tate Taylor, who directed The Help, is the director of the movie. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. All right. When an aspiring artist named Charlotte learned that she wasn't able to have children, her husband Tom started cheating on her and they got divorced. He went on to marry his mistress named Anna, and soon they were raising a child of their own in the very same house where Charlotte used to live with him. Now she passes by it every day on her train to work, fantasizing about what her life might have been. One day, as she's passing the house, Charlotte sees their neighbor, Megan, being attacked by a mysterious man. Megan babysits for Tom and Anna. A few days later, her body is found buried in a nearby forest. Police discover that she was pregnant at the time she died, and when Anna finds her cell phone in Tom's gym bag, the pieces fall into place. Tom had been having an affair with Megan and, upon learning she was pregnant, killed her. He was hoping to pin it all on Scott, framing him as the jealous husband, Now when Charlotte finds out, Tom tries to kill her, too, but Charlotte stabs him in the neck with a corkscrew in self-defense. Now united against their mutual ex-husband, Anna stands up for Charlotte in court. Charlotte goes on to write a graphic novel about the whole experience called The Girl on the Train. (laughs) The end. A couple notes. A couple thoughts. All right, all right. Uh, Scott is the husband of Megan. Did I not actually say that? I'm sorry. No, you just kind of threw Scott in there. I think I, I mean you mentioned I previously. It after the fact, but... I had a different version of this where oh. I explained more about Scott because there's like a whole romantic subplot with there's romantic Charlotte. subplots, a lot of them. But yeah, so, so like Charlotte has a fleeting romance with with Scott, the the morning husband of Megan. Yeah, um, I don't think uh, Megan's not being attacked by the guy. They're just having sex. When she sees from the train? Yeah. I thought it looked She's like a... he was coming at her, like attacking her. No, he was like caressing her and like oh. about to... Okay. Maybe he was very agro-sexual. I mean, possible. But <laughs> because uh, because she's not killed until later. Right. Yeah. Right. But still, this this is like a pivotal scene, which I still am not clear what actually happened here. But so she like jumps off the train because she sees somebody with Megan and she wants to know what's going on. Well, and it then, shatters like, her because she's been fantasizing about Megan and Scott as this perfect embodiment of like true love, marital love. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I think I guess she gets she hits her head when she jumps off or something, and then like she blacks out. Or it's not clear if she was attacked. This is what I don't know. She has all these flashbacks to this scene. Well, the thing, every time it's a little thing. different. Here's the thing. She's drunk all the time. That's, that's true. I forgot really, to mention. really, 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 really drunk. I forgot to mention she is, she's at ten, great, great at, alcoholic. At 5 p.m., at 10 p.m., at 8.31 in the morning, does not matter. She she's was drunk. injecting vodka into an orange with a needle so that she could eat the orange at work and get wasted. That's right. That's really hardcore. Yeah. Um, she later got fired from her job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but anyway... Yeah, they keep going back to that that scene where she was like, uh, she kind of blacked out and then she came to and then she she went out again and whatever. There's yeah. like a she had a glimpse of a woman running to Tom's car and you never really know exactly. It changes as her memory who the woman is if it's Megan or if it's Anna, his actual wife. It's right. yeah, that was all confusing. Or or even who the man in the car is. Is right. it Tom? Is it the psychologist? Is it? Right, because they're, yeah. Scott, I don't know. I yeah. don't remember all the different iterations of that, but. Well, because, yeah, they also go through several possible people that it could be that she saw Megan with on the on the train, and that was ridiculous to me because when, like, Charlotte is first telling Scott, the, uh, the husband, the, mm-hmm. the morning husband, she's like, the night that your wife disappeared, I saw her with this man, uh, and he, she says like he had dark hair. He looked like possibly Asian. And then, and then Scott says like, well, her therapist is Indian, which like, ooh, that's what? already kind of like, uh, Indian people are basically the same as Asian people, right? I mean, well, they are Asian. It's a subcontinent of Asia, and they, I don't think, look that similar, and that well, that, felt I mean, a little... That's, I mean, that's but true. Then, and then that's it, true, but and then India it ends is part up, of Asia, just as Russia is. Okay, fine, but then it ends up being a white dude. Yeah, that's which, that's the issue here. So we go, you... we go from thinking it's an Asian guy to an Indian guy to, oh, it's just a white so guy. So really, the only thing she was certain about was that it was a man. Yeah. And really, that was probably like a 50-50 guess for her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or I don't know, not, maybe not fifty-fifty, but okay, you fair. know, yeah, yeah. identify however one wants to. <laughs> um, but yeah, it it wasn't a forceful thing because she is Megan's racing fingers down the man's raven hair, yeah. and their lips touch. Yeah, but and but, then smack. Okay. Charlotte runs straight into Rob. Okay. Who what? is? Do you remember Rob? Yeah, the guy Rob's on the train. Rob's the man who some offered her some uh, alcohol from a flask at 8.31 in the morning <laughs> on a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And then they get drunk on the train, trade stories, and then fuck in uh, the metro bathroom. Yes, and I believe it actually says in the script, yeah, page 15, the two grope at each other like idiots. <laughs> so that's pretty endearing. Yeah, this was... But, um, yeah, let's can we zoom out a little bit here? Cause, well, okay, and I want to just... This is I a wanna, very poorly written screenplay. I've, uh, you beat me because I wanna, I just wanted to preface all this by saying that Stephen and I do not discuss what we think of these scripts before we start recording. That said, this was a really badly written script. <laughs> so Daniel is a very organized person. He has a lot of notes, but not only is... And I have a lot of notes, usually. But not only does he have a lot of notes, he categorizes them. I know exactly. And he highlights some. Where you're going. Um, and he usually has like a good column, a bad column, and an other column. This time he has nothing in the good column. I have a pretty long bad column. So, yeah, I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> Which but, I've never seen before. Yeah, I um, think that's a first. This, yeah, this was like quite painful to read at times, I felt. So what were your biggest grievances with it? I, I don't know like any of these characters. I don't get any of it. Like... Tom ends up. Being, I don't think I hate this as much as you. Oh, I yeah. This is. But I'm gonna let you go. All right. Tom. Tom ends up. So he cheated on Charlotte in the first place when they were married. Then mm-hmm. he cheated on Anna when they were married. Mm-hmm. And then he ends up killing Megan, mm-hmm. who he was cheating on Anna with, because she got pregnant, I guess. And I'm not really clear why he killed her. Like, if it was between getting caught for cheating and possibly getting caught for murder. I don't really know why he chose the murder. I don't know why he killed her, because it's not like Megan said, hey, I'm going to tell everyone that this baby's yours. She said, there's a chance it could be yours. You can be inv- as involved as you want. Yeah. I think I said this about another script recently. It, just, it seemed like everyone had all these secrets, and it was too much to believe. Like, Megan 
had a baby, I guess, years ago and, like, drowned it in the tub accidentally. Yeah. Um, Which is an interesting... Why, does that, why is that necessary? I, I don't know. That's what I'm saying about everyone having secrets. Like, it's... it's yeah ridiculous um but i mean everyone does have secrets yeah but like on not like baby killer kind of secrets that's like next level i I, I felt like it was all just too wrapped up together like these two people it's very incestuous kind of yeah i just i felt like the story was yeah too too self-contained there was like no outer world about it's just like these two houses that are a few doors apart and then charlotte who is really deeply connected to one of the families because she used to be married to Tom. And there's, like, no world outside of that in this yeah. story. I think it's okay because it sticks so closely to Charlotte's subjectivity. Does it, though? Because we, we, we see of it, other points of view. But most of it... But, I mean, she's kind of, like... Did, we, did I say this? That it's kind of reminiscent of Gone Girl in that it has a really unreliable narrator and we're seeing all these things through... We're seeing all of her memories, but her memories aren't reliable because she's a drunken mess at all times. The only things, the only memories we really see of her, of, of hers, are the that one particular night in question, which I still don't know what really happened there, and it doesn't no, ultimately matter. No, we see that other much. memories with Tom, don't we? Not really, do we? I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. I just I just felt like it was way too convoluted. Like I couldn't get a read on any of these characters. Right. At different They're... times they all seemed really brooding and suspicious. Uh like everyone seems like they're attracted to Charlotte at one point or another. She's like, okay, sleeping with Charlotte Scott. makes so many questionable choices. She sleeps with Scott, whose wife just died. Like that I just can't get my head around why he would be okay with doing that because he's not a good person like at first he's mourning for his wife's death and then he's like but he's also freaking emotionally out because, manipulative yeah too. and then, then he finds out that she was pregnant with someone else's baby when she died so then suddenly he like hates her yeah it's just it's all way too complicated and it doesn't amount to anything that actually makes sense on a character level to me like I, I don't understand why anyone's doing anything. Yeah, the characters were pitched like the the tone of this is like really heightened and like sharp in a way that the character actions don't really make sense if they're actually people. Yeah. But if you're making like a thematic point about people and like I'm drawing a circle capital with my P hand, people, capital P, like society and like what people yeah. do in the way that Gone Girl did. Uh huh. Like, the ending of Gone Girl doesn't really make too much sense that they stick together, you know? But it is about, like, the nature of marriage and marriage in society and yeah. that sort of thing. But they also don't hit that other mark. Yeah. That makes sense? I, I guess. I still, I can't really figure what out. What I was trying to say makes sense? Yeah. It's not the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, the movie does not make sense. But that's what I'm trying to figure out is why it works in Gone Girl and why it doesn't work here. Well, it didn't, Gone Girl didn't really work for me either. Oh, really? But, yeah. I liked it. Um, but uh, I don't want to just. Well, here's keep my ranting. biggest thing. Okay. Is that. And this isn't something I have like a huge problem with in moderation or from time to time. Okay. Like literally every other scene ends with something strange flashes in someone's eye. Or <laughs> she gives a sharp look. Or yeah. he gives a creepy smile. Or all these other things that, that drastically change how you view the scene. Or are meant to convey some substantial amount of information right. through really minuscule actions. Yeah, it's just a very non-visual uh, screenplay. Yeah, well, there are, there are also lots of parts where it's describing things that, yeah, that are not visual that we're not going to be able to see, which is a big no-no. Like, it'll say, you know, something like, Charlotte struggles, she's frustrated that she can't regain the memory. And yeah. it's like, okay, well, if you're, like telling an actress how to play that scene you can't just say that like what does that actually look like does she actually do something um there were also just some really oh my gosh megan's eyes look almost dead detached what is that how yeah. how? how yeah like how That's, is that gonna be it's not a concrete how am i gonna be able to tell that those eyes are dead and detached as opposed to sleepy or bored yeah or whatever that's else. not a concrete action that's not how you write a screenplay like this this one on 37 He's the type of person who, despite his overwhelming distress, seems even sexier when disheveled. So what does that mean? I have no yeah. idea. 
And then, oh my gosh, this was awful, I thought. Um, page 19, this is when... Oh, the creepy smile line? Uh, I don't know if it was that. Hold on. So, yeah, so Megan is seeing her therapist, and she's kind of, like, coming on to him in a weird way, because, of course, everyone is, like, into everyone in this script. But it says, Kamal, that's the therapist, Kamal, though attracted to Megan, realizes that he needs to nip this in the bud. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you can't see that. That's not a visual description. Right. What were you going to read? Something I was going to say later on there's a parenthetical where Dr. Yeah, Kamal says yes, but with a creepy smile. Yeah, it specifies in his line that he's doing a so creepy like, smile. So like why – first of all, it makes no sense for him to have a creepy smile there. <laughs> She's the one being creepy. Right. The only reason why that's there is to manipulate the reader. Yeah. It's probably not going to play for the audience. But it's meant to manipulate the reader and to make us suspect that he could be – some sort of sis- sinister presence in the film. Because yeah. later, Charlotte... Suspects that suspects he was that he, the one yeah. that yeah, was with Megan. Yeah. Similar, similarly, it's, this isn't a story that you could, like as a reader, you could piece together, you know? That, that really bothers me too. And that's the thing that... Um, I don't know if I've complained about this already. If I have, I apologize. But um, my, my go-to example for this is like the... National Treasure movies, mm-hmm. which I realize are a completely different kind of movie. But yes, to your point about it's it's not something that you could even figure out on your own because they make Nicolas Cage out to be like this brilliant guy who's solving all these puzzles. Okay, I'm on and it's, it's supposed to be really cool when you see him solve something like, oh, wow, he's so smart. But it's not satisfying at all because they don't even give the audience a chance to try and figure it out. And this is the same thing. It's just like creating this ridiculous puzzle and then figuring it out for you. Uh, they're creating this ridiculous puzzle, but they're giving us none of the pieces. Yeah. The pieces are all locked in Charlotte's head. Yeah. Like, there's exceptions, or there's... If a movie does this in a different way, the like where it becomes about like the unknowability or the complexity of something, that's different, because that's like a thematic concern. Sure, sure. Which is not if, at if, all the case here. It's it's like almost uh, an existential type thing. It's exactly. Like these These... Things can never be fully right. Understood. It's beyond our comprehension. That, I, but that's, no, this person is just drunk, and the screenplay is slowly parsing out, clues. slowly doling yeah. out clues. Yeah, yeah. They're not even clues. They're slowly doling out stuff, and then they give us the answer at the end. Yeah. the The ideal, I think, the way that it should be done is you have a, a puzzle that you build that is complicated enough that it's it's difficult for the audience. But once you reveal it to them. They look back and they realize, oh, I should have known. I should have known. known. I should have when seen this. When this or that yeah. happened back there, that exactly. was a clue that I could have picked up. And then that makes you want to watch it again, and it makes it even more satisfying. Totally, totally. But, but this, yeah, there was no way you would ever figure this stuff out. It's not even a revealing, or a, it's not even a satisfying twist that it is Tom. Just because, yeah. sure, it's Tom. It I mean, It could have been Tom, it could have been Scott, it could have been Everyone in this was kind could've of... Could have been Charlotte, could have been yeah, any of the characters. Everyone in this was brooding and like, right. mysterious. Also, just the way they reveal information is, is so boring to me, which I feel like... That is the crux of these kind of movies, too, is like cool revelations of clues. But Mm -hmm. half the time, it's just like, all right, there was a scene where these detectives were questioning Charlotte because she had just, you know, seen Megan before she disappeared with this guy. So they want to know what she knows. And she's telling them, and then they leave. And then she runs out the door after them and then says, I'm sorry, I lied about this. She, She had told them where she worked, and she's like, I lied. I actually got fired. I haven't been at work in two months. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, okay, so you've just been riding the train back and forth to pretend like you're going to work. And she's like, I'm sorry, how is this relevant to your investigation? And it's like, <laughs> okay, you brought that up. You just said that. So what do you want? It was right? Especially so when stupid. they're inquiring about her whereabouts at a certain time. Yeah, I think that is relevant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but there were so many parts like that where this it was the same thing when Morgan, I'm sorry, Megan was was revealed to have drowned her baby years ago. It that was Absolutely. it was purely through dialogue that we learned that. Yeah. The characters, the dialogue was written with a pretty similar voice for most of them, I felt like, especially the women. Yeah. They sounded pretty interchangeable to me. I would have been curious to know whoa, whoa, why does it say Pokemon down there? Well that's not how you spell Eevee. I know it's not, but that's how you would say that, right? Tom, yeah, Tom yeah, and how you would say it, Tom and Anna's baby is named Eevee. Yeah. Which is silly to me just because 
they named their kid after a Pokemon. Well, Pokemon are dope, so an Eevee's a pretty cool Pokemon. Maybe someday that and, you child will grow up to be a Jolteon. If you want your child to have like every opportunity, like you want her to do whatever she wants to do with her life, what better name than Eevee who can evolve into many different Pokemon? <laughs> That's that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, we should truly... We should that, all... I think, is really the crux of the story. Oh, okay. You can be whatever um, you want to be. Yeah. But there's there's way too much... Charlotte gives the strangest little smile a moment of reprieve. Repre- reprieve? Charlotte gives the... Str- Cut that first part. <laughs> Charlotte gives the strangest little smile a moment of reprieve from her troubled mind. This hits a chord... This hits a deep chord in Megan, but she covers it with jargon. Yeah, see, you can't do that in a screenplay. That's just not... She looks at her refle- reflection in the full-length mirror. She makes a hard decision. That I remember that one, too. Come on! Come on! What does it look like to make a hard decision? <laughs> hmm. Is she standing there like this? Like, yeah. stroking her chin? Yeah. The sight causes something to dawn on her. The, there was... Uh, it also bothered Something darker me. flashes in Anna's eyes. It also anyway, bothered sorry. me that, like... Uh, this is another reason none of these people felt real to me. I never saw any of them at work, um, and I just they didn't really have any kind of personality or like hobbies or skills or like in, not, no yeah characterizing features I whatsoever. Mean, I wonder if we're not, or I wonder if we need to take a step back and look at it in the in terms of the genre, where this uh-huh. is like a. Sleaze is not the right word, but it's like a sultry paperback, sure. like airplane novel. Sure, like a dime store romance. Type yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah, where it's really just about like ticking these boxes for the reader. Like there's sex, there's murder, there's yeah. romantic entanglements, like there's all like, that stuff. There's like the forbidden love. It's like this. Yeah. It's like this. T- twisted semi wish fulfillment thing where yeah. like you wish your love life was this interesting and you probably also wish you could and stab you, your ex-husband in the throat right and you don't want to actually think about work so that's why you're reading this in the first place so that's true you know and and i was thinking about this too when i was i was complaining to myself while reading this about how i don't know what any of these people do it doesn't seem like they're ever at work um i i I have mixed feelings about that because I think a lot of movies define their characters by what their job is, which I think is kind of an interesting reflection of our culture, maybe, as Americans. I don't know because I don't. I should really watch more foreign films to confirm this, but I feel like Americans get really wrapped up in their job representing who they are because in America you're supposed to be able to achieve your dreams and do whatever you want to do, and so you should be pursuing your passion. I think in like Europe, a lot of people are a lot more content to just have a job that's a job. And then they just are happy doing what they want to do in their free time. But anyway, my point is, these people had neither in this script. They had no job. They had no like personal interests. That no, they, they were just flat. But um, I don't know where I was going with that. I just got on a no, no, no. Rant. Oh, oh, I know. I was gonna say, if this is a trashy sort of dime store romance thing, I can give you a much better film that does that. And I was very pleasantly surprised. Did I tell you that I watched Swim Fan recently? No. That is a good movie. What? And it's in this exact same genre. Uh, it was like an early 2000s, yeah. Really? Thriller about like a stalker girlfriend in high school. So it was good. It, it was... that 14% on Rotten Tomatoes? <laughs> 29 on Metacritic. <laughs> Whatever. It was exactly what it should be. Okay. And this, and this, it's in this exact genre. Shoot. So if Shall you... Watch it? Anyone who wants to see Girl on the Train that thinks it's going to be good, don't see it. Go see Swim Fan for yeah. free. You can watch it. Like I, I think I watched it on uh, online. Like on, it was like HBO or something. I forget. But oh, Mister HBO over here. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but yeah, you see Swim Fan instead. Yeah. That's that's my final say. Ooh. Oh, never mind. Um, yeah, and I'm sure there's plenty of other better examples. It's yeah. not just Swim Fan. Right. That operate right. better in this genre. Right. Um, I feel like we've been going for a while, but we haven't really. We've just been very passionate. As yeah. Well. Um, I don't really have a whole lot else to say. I think I think they are. I think there is some thematic thing about like misogyny going on here, just like by how awful the guys are. Yeah, I yeah. think you're you're being I'm, pretty I'm, generous. Maybe I'm being yeah. Maybe I'm just looking for something that's not there. But it uh, 
That's not good. I don't know if it could be good if it were written. If well, I'm it, not sure if this could be a good movie. I think it might. I think maybe, but it's it's hard to say, and this is why I'm gonna have a hard time. I'm not gonna have a hard time giving it a verdict. I know what my verdict is, but I don't know how much I can assign blame to the screenwriter because I just, well, no, this, you can because it's a horrible screenplay. As a screenplay, okay, it's okay. really bad. Yes, you're structurally, right. Structurally, well, but that's what I was saying is like some of this has to be blamed on the book. But you're right, even like the way in which it's written is bad for mm-hmm. a screenplay, so I can still blame the screenwriter for that. But totally. But I do wonder how how far this is from the book and if maybe the book is a little bit more coherent. Like why do we need all these flashbacks that come at the end after we after I don't know. Have we Charlotte kills Have we talked at length about flashbacks? I hate flashbacks. It always? Almost, almost always. Hmm. It's hard to justify them. If you can justify them, fine. But I feel they're not like justified here. They're just tacked on. The, as... def- the default should always be tell your story chronologically. If you aren't going to do that, I don't know about that. You need to have a really, really clear reason for it. I think I disagree with that. That's okay. That's my two cents. I just think it should make sense and it should be cohesive. Yeah. Which well, this is not. These are just we can agree on a that. bunch yeah. of stuff tacked on at the end. Yeah, I'm I'm all out, I think. Okay. Um we have a website, ospodcast.com. You can email us at info at ospodcast.com. We're on Facebook, Facebook.com slash ospodcast. We're on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um we're on Twitter at OS Podcast. Also we're on iTunes, and that's our bread of and butter. So yes. if you could subscribe to us there like us maybe write a review that'd be fantastic or just stars you don't have to write anything just give us a rating yeah um okay that's it right we're on stitcher yeah. you said the email right i did info at yeah. OS Podcast. if you have any requests stuff you think we should read we try our best if, to accommodate them if you have your own opinions that you want to share I would love to hear someone defend this movie because I feel like we were kind of no, per- not we're- the movie because we're not going to see the movie. Defend the screenplay. Okay, well, fine, but yeah, I, I felt like we were kind of brutal, and I, I try not to be, but I, uh, I feel like no, I don't know. But this one is like really bottom of like yeah the barrel for me, like in terms of all the scripts that we've read so far. Really, yeah, really, it interesting. I think maybe because you, it's like structurally bad, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean it's. It's almost completely without structure to me. Like, I couldn't tell you one character's motivation in this whole thing. Right, right, right. And that is, that is like, the foundation of structure for me is, is what the character wants. And I just, yeah, I had nothing. Okay. So, yeah, so for me, on the writer and the script, hard pass. Let me give a definite pass on the writer. And I wasn't opposed to considering the... the the story, the script, so. but I'm not going to because okay. it, there's not enough there. There's yeah, just not. It, it not feels, even, not even close, really. It feels it's like a double pass for me. Yeah, it, it feels like someone took a bunch of thrillers, and not not unlike what often happens in a, like a thriller. If you have like you know like a ransom note where they cut out all the letters mm-hmm. so that you can't see their handwriting, it's like somebody wrote a movie like that where they just cut out pieces of thrillers and they like borrow just like moods and genres and types of scenes and types of characters and just it's just like a hodgepodge of all of those that does not amount to anything greater than the sum of its parts it's just like a bunch of tone and style Mm -hmm. no substance so double passes from both of us next week we're reading i don't know so there is no, there is no. Well, next week is going to be a different sort of episode for us. Uh, we're going to actually be interviewing a screenwriter uh, named David Broyles. Um, should we mention the Austin Film Festival? We have to, yeah. This yeah. was put together. Th- the the Austin Film Festival actually reached out to us. We were very flattered. They, it's a tremendous. I feel pretty they, honored. Yeah, they have one of I would say the most respected screenplay contests out there um, every year, and. Yeah, they reached out to us and they they put us in touch with one of their list of screenwriters to watch. They they issue a list of screenwriters to watch every year. And David Broyles was on that list. They hooked us up and now we are going to be interviewing him 
next week. So that's super exciting. Yeah. And we'll we'll talk more about his credits and, and what kind of stuff he With does. With him next week. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. 